dismissed to go to junior worship. <clears throat> I read a story, a true story, about a boy who was being made fun of at school. This is back in the 1930s. The story took place back then. I didn't read it back then. That was before my time. <laughs> but this boy, uh, the other kids would make fun of him at school. They started calling him Sparky. And this was a nickname they got from a comic strip back then about a, a horse named Sparkplug. And the boy hated this nickname, but he could never shake it. Just kind of stuck with him. And school was really difficult for Sparky. You see, he, he wasn't very smart, and he was socially challenged. He failed every subject in the eighth grade. And when he finally made it to high school, he, he flunked physics, he flunked Latin, he flunked algebra, and he flunked English. He didn't do very good in sports either. He, he, tried, he tried out for the golf team and made the golf team, but his poor play wound up costing his school the championship. And so, you know, he continued to feel like a loser throughout his youth. Um, he wasn't very good socially. Uh, nobody ever paid much attention to him. He was astonished if any of his classmates would say, to hello, say hello to him outside of class, outside of school. He never dated never asked any girls out because he was afraid of rejection. He knew they'd tell him no. Sparky was constantly struggling with negative thoughts about who he was and, and about his worth as a person. In his youth, he, he developed a hobby. He liked to draw and he liked cartoons, so he started drawing cartoons. However, no one thought they were any good. He, he submitted some of his cartoons to the school yearbook, but they were rejected. He kept drawing anyway. He had a dream that one day he could be an artist for Walt Disney. So after graduating from high school and starting college, he, he wrote a letter to Walt Disney Studios asking if there were any job opportunities. And they sent him a form letter for him to fill out, requesting some samples of his artwork. And there, were also, there was also an instruction for him to draw a cartoon of a man repairing a clock by shoveling gears and springs into the clock. Make this a funny cartoon, it said. So he tried that. He did the best he could, and he, he sent that drawing off along with some of his other work to Walt Disney Studios, and he waited for their reply, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. Several weeks later, he finally got a reply. It was another form letter rejecting him, saying that there were, at this time, no job opportunities for this artist. Sparky was disappointed, but not surprised. He had always been a loser, and this was just one more loss. He thought, in a weird way, this life of his was kind of funny. And so he started to draw cartoons about his life. A childhood full of misadventures, a little boy loser, a chronic underachiever. And the cartoon character has now become known worldwide. Who was Sparky, the boy who failed eighth grade? The boy whose art was turned down not just by Disney, but by his own school yearbook? It was Charles Schultz the creator of the Peanuts comic strip, the creator of that little underachiever whose, whose kite would never fly, Charlie Brown. Do you ever feel like Sparky? Do you ever feel like, oh man, I can't do anything right? I think we all at times wrestle with our thoughts. and We all struggle with negative thinking I want you to know that God is concerned about your thoughts. Your thoughts are important to God. You see, how we think and, and what you think about yourself will determine the course of your life. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, 
so is he. And every word that we speak, every behavior that we practice, every attitude that we have starts between our ears. It starts with the way we think and how we think about ourselves. And Satan knows that. Our enemy, Satan, attacks us first on the battlefield of the mind, in our thoughts. He knows that if he wants to win a battle over us, he must influence the way we think. And if we want to have victory over Satan's attacks, we must guard our thoughts. King David was well acquainted with the wrestling, the struggling with the thoughts of his heart and of his mind. He said in Psalm 13 too, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Can you relate to what David is going through here? Do you know the struggle that David is having in his heart and in his mind? If you're like most people, you probably face a daily battle with negative thinking. I mean, evil thoughts are so prevalent, especially in our society today. Well, in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us how we can have victory over evil thoughts. You see, Paul had some pretty harsh critics at Corinth. And and they were making all kinds of false accusations against him. These haters were starting to influence the church with negative thinking and false views. So Paul warns his readers in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. He says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am quote unquote timid when face to face with you, but Bold went away. See, that was one of the accusations. Oh, yeah, he's, he's bold in his letters, but when you get him face to face, he's a baby. He's a lamb. We can walk right over him. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. These critics thought and claimed that Paul was living by the standards of the world. Of course, anyone who knew the Apostle Paul also knew that that accusation was absolutely ridiculous and it had no evidence to support it. But still, when people make false accusations against us, even ridiculous accusations it can still affect the way people think of us. And it can still affect the way we think of ourselves in a negative way. What do we do with these evil thoughts? How do we have victory over these evil thoughts? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's take a look at these first five verses and see what Paul says about gaining victory over evil thoughts. The first thing we need to do, we must reject the values of the world. He says in verse 3, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Paul's critics accused him of living by the standards of the world, but actually they, the critics, They were the ones who were living by the standards of the world. They were the ones trying to promote themselves at the expense of others. They were the ones who were making excuses for their sinful lifestyles. And they were the ones who were rejecting God's inspired word through the Apostle Paul. Paul, on the other hand, he knew that he was to be in the world, but not be of the world. He knew that struggle, and he lived out his Christianity with conviction, having a powerful effect on the people around him in the world, but yet not compromising 
his values in Christ. You see, Jesus sent all of his disciples, including us, out into the world to preach the gospel to the whole world. But he also sent us to show the world a different value system by being holy, sanctified, set apart, different from the rest of the world. Matter of fact, this was the prayer of Jesus. The night before he was crucified, he prayed this. In John 17, 15 through 18, Jesus said, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. This must be our constant prayer as well. If we're going to be effective in our mission as Christians, uh, preaching the gospel, taking the gospel to the world, we must live this out. We must pray this prayer. We must be in the world and yet not be of the world. How do we do that? How can we effectively bring the gospel to the world without letting the world change our values. Jesus tells us right here in this prayer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, sanctify means to make holy, to be set apart, to be different. Sanctify them by your truth, by your word. The word of God is what sets us apart. The word of God is what sanctifies us. The word of God is what protects our minds and our hearts our hearts from the evil thoughts of this world and from the evil one who is attacking us. That's how we can have victory over evil thoughts. We must also use our powerful spiritual weapons. In verse 4, Paul says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. As Christians, we are engaged every day in a spiritual battle, a great battle. Whether we realize it or not, there is a battle going on. We can't see it with our physical eyes, but it is there. It's taking place on the battlefield of our minds and in our hearts through thoughts and ideas. Satan and his demons are very real and he is trying to set up strongholds of evil thoughts and false ideas in our hearts and in our minds. We must learn to use the divine spiritual weapons that God has given to every Christian. The weapons God has given us are far superior to the weapons of the world. See, these weapons, he says, these weapons have divine power. They can pull down strongholds. They can defeat Satan's attacks. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us about the armor of God as he extends this metaphor, this word picture of spiritual warfare. He says in in chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after after you've done everything, to stand Stand firm then, he continues in verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled about your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always, always keep on praying for all the saints. 
Notice in Paul's instructions there at the very end in verse 18, he talks about prayer. And he doesn't connect prayer with any one piece of armor. He doesn't label it as, you know, something else, as your spear or as... uh, What's another piece of armor that he doesn't talk about? Your tank or maybe your submarine or maybe your, your F-14 Tomcat. He, you know, it's all those things. You see, prayer is not limited to just one piece of armor. Prayer is an essential aspect of every piece of armor. Through prayer, we put on each of these pieces of armor. Through prayer, we're enabled to utilize the weapons, the spiritual weapons that make us uh, superior to any of Satan's attacks. Prayer is how we put on the armor. Prayer is the most powerful of all of these because it connects us with all of these. In December 2004, a single question from a young soldier touched off a media firestorm. U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld had come to deliver a pep talk to the troops in Kuwait. But the secretary found himself blindsided by a bold question. As the news cameras rolled, Army Specialist Thomas Wilson of the 278th Regimental Combat Team asked Rumsfeld, why do we soldiers have to dig through local landfills to find pieces of scrap metal and compromised ballistic glass to upgrade our vehicles. Uh, uh, uh. The secretary was speechless. Specialist Wilson clearly felt that he was being sent into battle without proper equipment. You know, as Christians, we don't have to worry about that problem. Our supreme commander generously equips us with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But you know, it's up to us to pray about each of these items. It's up to us to put on the armor of God, and it's up to us to put them into practice in our daily lives. We have the equipment. We have the weapons. We have the armor. It's up to us to use it. If we use it, we'll have victory over our evil thoughts. We must also demolish thinking that is against God. Paul says in verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul's critics were passing on these false arguments and these evil thoughts, and they were not only against Paul, they were also against God. And Paul knew that these false ideas were having a negative effect on the Christians there at Corinth. So in these final chapters of the letter, Paul is going to completely demolish all of these arguments his critics are bringing up. In this verse, Paul is extending the metaphor of warfare. You see, in in ancient times, certain cities were fortified as strongholds. They had walls, they had towers, watchtowers, and they had troops. And they were in key locations. A king who wanted to conquer a neighboring nation would fortify a city in a key location, maybe on a trade route or maybe on the border, and he would use that as a stronghold for his troops, a point from which to launch an attack. We live in a culture that is full of ideas, philosophies, arguments that are against God. And as you look at our culture, you can see how we have allowed Satan to fortify strongholds in key locations, strongholds of these ideas against God in key locations of our culture. Can you think of some of those key locations? Our schools, our universities, the media, 
And sadly, even in some of our churches, there are strongholds of false ideas. We need to remember that these locations and institutions are not the strongholds themselves. The strongholds are the ideas raised up against the knowledge of God. The ideas are the things we need to attack. The ideas are the things that God has given us weapons to destroy. Jude says in Jude verses 3 and 4, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Even there in the first century, it had come into the churches. And the inspired writers were saying, Christians, wake up. We need to contend for the faith. We need to guard against this. Satan is establishing a stronghold even in our midst. He says they are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality. And they deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. God expects us to contend for the faith of New Testament Christianity. We have been entrusted with the responsibility of keeping the faith of Christianity pure and true, and that includes God's standards for morality. That's not a popular message in our culture today. The morality taught in the Bible, we have to stand up for that and contend for that. That is being questioned in every corner of our culture and reject it, even in legis legislature. And so this fight is not easy. But I want to remind you, it is not these organizations, these institutions that we're trying to tear down. It is these ideas and we need to reassert the ideas of Scripture, the values of God, the morality taught in Christianity back into these institutions. That's how we can have victory over evil thoughts in our society today. We must also make every thought obedient to Christ. Not just the ideas, the arguments that are out there in society, but the ideas that are right here in our own minds and in our own hearts. We need to make sure that they are being brought into obedience to Christ. This verse says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. D.A. Carson points out that Paul's language of demolish, of demolition, is not just about winning arguments and debates. He writes, he means something far more. His weapons destroy the way people think. They demolish, these weapons demolish their sinful thought patterns, the mental structures by which they live their lives in rebellion against God. You see, in ancient warfare, when a stronghold was defeated, they would pull down the watchtower. They would break down the walls. They would take captive the opposing forces. If we want to have victory over our evil thoughts, we need to do the same thing. We need to tear down the strongholds, those towers that Satan is trying to build up into our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds. When we're struggling with evil thinking, we need to pull those thoughts down we need to renew our mind through prayer and through reading God's word and through our fellowship together as Christians. This verse is actually our VIP for the, word, for the week. VIP is our verse in practice. And I want to encourage you to, to look at this verse, to read this verse at least once each day this week and pray for God to help you put it into practice. If you have a, a, a smartphone or a tablet or, or even a computer, this is something that I, I did. 
Um, I put this uh, verse into a picture, and I, I post it on my Facebook. If you, if you want, I can send it to you, or you can go to my Facebook and see it. And you could, you could just download that picture onto your device and then go into your settings and make it your background on your phone or on your device for the week. And so every time I, I look at my phone, I'm reminded, oh, yeah, my verse in practice, my VIP, and I say a quick prayer, and I say, okay, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. God, help me to take captive my thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. So I have that constant reminder before me. As we do this, I promise you, as you focus just on one verse a week and pray about it, you're going to see incredible changes in your life. You're going to see the Holy Spirit moving in your life and giving you victory. And that's something we need, especially over our thoughts. Another great way for us to make our thoughts obedient to Christ is by singing and listening to Christian music. Uh, that's, that's powerful because it's easy to remember. We can remember the lyrics of our favorite worship song. And a lot of times they speak to the very things that we're going through. I heard a testimony about this from uh, a church that was in China going through persecution in China. Uh, Chinese officials from the Public Security Bureau invaded a Sunday school room at a church in early 2005. They found 30 children inside, and they herded them into a van. Despite the scary situation, one child started to sing a praise song to Jesus. And in a few minutes, all the children in the van were singing that song. Upon the arrival at the police station, the children were marched into the interrogation room, still singing the song as they marched through the hallway. The Chinese officers attempted to force the children to write, I do not believe in Jesus, telling them that they had to write it a hundred times before they would be released. Instead, the children wrote, I believe in Jesus today, I will believe in Jesus tomorrow, I will believe in Jesus forever. Exasperated, the officials called the children's parents. And, and some of the parents came and they renounced Christ in order to get their kids back. However, one widow refused to deny Jesus when she came to pick up her twin sons. The officers threatened her, saying, If you do not deny Jesus, you will not receive your sons back. She said, Well, I guess you'll just have to keep them. Because without Jesus, there'd be no way that I'd be able to take care of them. <laughs> the exasperated officials said, fine, take your sons and go. <laughs> Praising God is powerful. It reinforces our heart. And it protects our thoughts. It brings our thoughts into obedience with Christ. Paul said in Colossians 2, 6 through 8, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world, rather than on Christ. You see, when we focus our thoughts on Christ, the strongholds of these false ideas don't stand a chance. Christianity was not meant to be a religion where we just put our brains in neutral and let other people do our thinking for us. God wants His people to be thinking people. God wants us to think about what we believe, about our convictions, about our faith in Christ. He wants us to study His Word, and He wants us to live out our faith in Christ in meaningful ways. Through Christ, we can have victory over our evil thoughts. How can we have victory over our evil thoughts? Well, we need to reject the values of this world. We need to use the powerful spiritual weapons that God has given to us. We need to demolish the thinking that is against God. And we need to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I'd like to have the praise team come at this time and prepare to lead us in a closing song. And as they do that, uh, think about 
your thoughts this week? How will you have victory over the evil thoughts that you get bombarded with throughout the week? Remember this passage. Remember our verse in practice for this week. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Let's be standing for a concluding prayer. And after we pray, we'll sing one more song. I want to encourage all of you to uh, enjoy a time of fellowship and some refreshments in the entryway of the church. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are so thankful that you do give us victory and that the weapons you've supplied for us are powerful. They have divine power to pull down the strongholds of evil thoughts in our world today. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that when we're struggling with negative thoughts about ourselves or about others, that you would remind us that we have these weapons at our disposal and that you've given us the ability to pull down those strongholds and renew our thinking through Jesus Christ. And God, I pray if there's anyone here struggling with negative thoughts, worry, concern, or, or evil thoughts of the world, that you'd help them to experience victory today and this week through renewing their minds in your word and in prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Trust what you say, that 
dismissed. God bless.